First off, our RAN. Every time you open your phone or your computer, your brain is walking onto a battleground for the scarcest resource of the 21st century, specifically your attention. Not too long ago, capturing your attention was the wizardry or the job for Don Draper. Don's ability to gain consumer attention through overt transgressions of social norms relating to sex, violence, race, and religion help create brand associations pasted onto a mediocre product resulting in irrational margins and a disco party of shareholder gains that fueled the brand age until the introduction of Google. Back in the 70s, the average American would be hit with 500 ads per day. That number now, over 5,000. At the heart of ad-supported media, one oversimplified metric that the entire industry relies on, engagement. Simply put, this is the currency of the attention economy. The custodians of engagement used to be the madmen of Madison Avenue, but have since transitioned to the math men of the Bay Area. Under an advertising-driven revenue model, both media and technology companies do their utmost to induce users to spend even more time on each of their platforms every day. The difference is that CNN and Fox News are dumpster fires, while Facebook and Google are hydrogen bombs. Facebook and Google aren't doing anything. CNN and Fox aren't doing it. They're just doing it much better. Big tech super weapons are their algorithms which know us better than we know ourselves. Almost half of teens say they use the internet almost constantly in 2020. That's up twofold from 2015. Another 44% said they're online several times a day. A quarter of teens say social media has had a mostly negative effect on them. If teens say something is negative, that means it's like crazy bad. Algorithms are optimized for engagement, which is Latin for outrage, polarization, and extremities. Researchers at NYU measured the reach of a half a million tweets and found that each moral or emotional word used increased virality by 20% on average, or simply put, incendiaries result in greater stakeholder value for these platforms. Another study demonstrated that posts exhibiting indignant disagreement received twice as much engagement as other content on Facebook. Another language lesson, when Facebook says its mission is to bring the world closer together, it's Latin for creating the Olympics for the most inflammatory posts to sell more Chobani ads. So when Zuckerberg's referencing the First Amendment, what he's really thinking is his second Gulfstream. Every decision at Facebook is focused on enhancing shareholder value, as it likely should be. And to make shareholders more money or specifically buttress his own pocketbook, Zuckerberg was never going to do anything about the inflammatory posts of his strongest ally, Donald Trump. By the way, Zuckerberg is the definition of an oligarch who uses his proximity to power to corruptly enrich himself. Jack Dorsey is another tech exec that's been a huge beneficiary of Trump. That's right. Twitter stock has doubled after being cut in half since Trump's inauguration, rising from 16 bucks in the first year of his presidency to 32 bucks a day, boosting Dorsey's stake in the company from 275 million to 610 million. So you gotta ask yourself for a third of a billion dollars, would you ignore genocide on your platform? Maybe, maybe around one in five adult Twitter users in the US, 19% follow Trump. For Dorsey, this is a great opportunity for him to transcend his peers, similar to what he does on one of those 10 day Vipassana retreats he takes as the sometimes CEO of Twitter when he's not in Africa or getting his nose pierced. Get off my line, Jack. Anyways, Twitter can start cleaning up its platform several ways. First off, enforce terms and conditions, deleting many accounts from both sides of the political spectrum. Two, enforcing identity and extinguishing bots. And finally, abandoning, abandoning the cancer, the tobacco of our media landscape, the advertising model. Twitter could shift to a subscription-based model and stop fueling the advertising-driven supernova of rage that his platform has become. Not only is deflating the supernova of outrage good for society, it would be good for Twitter shareholders. I've got a quarter of a million followers on Twitter, which is valuable for me on many dimensions. If Twitter went to a subscription model that meant my followers could live in an ad-free world, 
I would pay for that privilege and that reach, probably to the tune of at least 100 bucks a month. If you're Kim Kardashian with 65 million followers, that might be worth 10,000 or more a month. At $120,000 a year, okay, that sounds expensive. But compared to a billboard in Times Square that might cost you upwards of $4 million and not be as effective, it begins to look like a great value. In the short term, revenues would likely decline. But the market rewards recurring revenues. Just as Adobe took their software from $1,299 to $29.99 a month, Revenues went down, but came back as recurring revenues, and since then, the stock is up tenfold. They would save nearly a billion dollars on annual sales and marketing expenses, shifting to the better subscription model. If Jack is the man, if Jack is the person, if Jack has the empathy he claims and is the PR wizard he's proven to be, this is an unbelievable opportunity for what might be the next big unlock, the next big unlock, in modern business history. Come to the light, Jack. Leave the dark side. I see light in you, Jack. Come to the force. We need you.